All of the major news stories made simple and easy for your listening pleasure. We'll break it down for you in keywords for the segment. We're joined by Adam. Good morning. Happy Friday, Lena. <laughs> Do you hear like a sigh coming out of Adam's <laughs> voice as we say hello? <laughs> Not very subtle. Uh, I'm just having difficulty breathing. Uh, it, really? Yeah. We've mm. taken our, off our face masks for, well, in, in, in line with the living with COVID-19 yeah. of uh, phase one. Right. But I've forgotten how to breathe without a face mask. I know. It's kind of become a, a part of us and yeah. uh it is liberating yes that yes. i'm not wearing it anymore but still you know yeah. you kind of get used to it and it warmed my face during it, the kind of colder uh, uh, weathers you know yeah. it's actually much easier yeah. to bear the cold mm. with uh, the face that is, mask that is very true i've noticed that we're very um yeah. We've chosen black today for our outfits, <laughs> <laughs> along with white sneakers. Uh, a black Friday. Or trainers, as they say in the UK. <laughs> uh, is that really how that goes? Yeah. Trainers. I guess yeah. that makes sense. You yeah. train in them, right. although I'm wearing sneakers, but I'm so not going to train. Is that because you sneak in them? Please stop. <laughs> Sorry. Please stop. That can okay. go on for a really okay. long time. It can, yeah. You know, that lines up a Black Friday. I, I believe the Korea <sighs> Sale Festa is happening as we speak, which black is Korea's Friday. version of Black Friday. Yeah. yeah? But it goes on for longer than a day, though, right? It goes yeah, on for yeah. an entire month. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's right. jump into some keywords uh, this morning, hopefully clarifying some of the major headlines for you. We're going to start off with our COVID-19 coverage. Here's our first pick of the day. Pandemic. So cases are still hovering at the mid 2000s since eased virus curves. It was expected, however, the death toll has also increased, sparking concerns. What's the latest? Yes, it was quite uh, a high death toll. Yeah. Korea reported 24 deaths caused by COVID 19 uh, yesterday. That's the highest tally since January 12th when 25 people died of the disease. Uh, the figure also marks the most deaths after the fourth wave began to spread in early July, and I think is the second highest highest ever uh, death toll since the pandemic began. Uh, the country's death uh, daily death toll has kept rising, in fact, from 9 to 16, 18 in the first three mm. days of this week before reaching that 24 on Thursday. However, the fatality rate remained unchanged at 0.78%, and the death toll is now just over 2,900. Of the 29 deaths that were reported yesterday, 58% were unvaccinated, so more than half of them. Mm. 17% had received their first shots. Six people were fully inoculated, um, so they were the mm. so-called breakthrough infections. Okay. All the people were aged over 60. 22 of them had underlying health issues. Um, despite a rapid vaccination campaign, there are still many people who are yet to get their shots. Mm. Uh, yesterday, more than 70% of the new COVID-19 patients have not been vaccinated. 24% mm. of them were in their teens. Mm. Uh, in the eight weeks from August 29th, nearly 56% of new COVID-19 patients were said to be unvaccinated. So mm. that just... Uh, highlights the importance of vaccinations during this time as well. And uh, wearing face masks and mm. social distancing, keeping uh, personal hygiene in check, because, I mean, just making sense of these numbers, right? We mm. we tend to let out a sigh of relief in, in mm. that kind of we've reached that herd immunity. I'm using air quotes, by the mm -hmm. way. However, if you take a closer look at the number of those who are fully vaccinated, which is around 76% who are mm -hmm. fully vaccinated in the country, that's still 14% of 51 million people who are not vaccinated. Mm. That's still a significant amount of people. Simple math tells me that's 7 million people that are unvaccinated in the country. That's right. And it only takes one person to right. infect an entire population. It is a virus that is very transmissible after all. So, exactly. Yeah. So even though we sound absolutely like broken records going mm. round and round, it is yeah. sticking to the basics that matters most at this time. Yes. But something that yeah. uh, we should note is I spoke to uh, an expert, uh, a virus or pandemic related infectious disease expert I should call him and uh, he did note that the death toll now being so high is actually kind of a natural occurrence because we're into mm. some time of the pandemic and those who have suffered from it now is kind of the timeline mm -hmm. in which their uh, illnesses kind of deteriorate even more and unfortunately lead to death now mm. especially among the po uh, elderly population it's mm. kind of that time frame okay. that we're in now so yeah okay so there is not that to spark also too to much in. alert uh, alarm rather uh, is what I'm trying to say. And I think managing that fear is also important and taking mm. a look at those daily figures. That's right. All right, on to our second keyword of the day. 
Merck pill authorized. Uh, Britain has become the first country in the world to approve a potentially game-changing COVID-19 antiviral pill. They were also the first country to implement the vaccination campaign. And I remember mm. UK citizens not being too pleased with that because, well, who wants to be the first Well, in it's, this context? It's a bit embarrassing, but uh, I think British people do want to be the first in everything. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's kind of in their nature, I think. My, my point being... <laughs> Um, there are also, I guess, potential risks and concerns that come with being the first in releasing these drugs. However, yeah, there's yeah. also a sense of excitement around the antiviral pill for right. it being a potential game changer. Yeah, this was kind of in the headlines for a while now, and uh, a lot of attention was paid yeah. to it. Uh, it is a pill that's been developed jointly by Ridgeback Biotherapeutics and Merck. It is called Molnupiravir. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be the market name. I think they might change it. Uh, the UK's medicines regulator said the pill uh, will be given twice a day to vulnerable patients recently diagnosed with the disease. Mm. Now, in clinical trials, the pill cut the risk of hospitalization or death by about half. It was actually interestingly originally developed to treat flu. Mm. Um, the UK has agreed to purchase 480,000 courses with uh, the first deliveries expected in November, mm. although the details of that distribution plan and why how it's happening so quickly is uh, hasn't been revealed. Because weren't there concerns that it would take actually months before Right. the pills were uh, shipped out. But mm. again, I guess going forward, we'll get more details on That's that. That's right. Uh, yeah. Initially, it will be given to both the vaccinated mm. and unvaccinated patients through a, a national study uh, with extra data on its effectiveness collected before any decision to order more. Uh, the drug needs to be given within five days of symptoms with de- uh, developing to the mo- to be most effective. So basically, as soon as the, uh, on onsets of symptoms, this is when the drug is most recommended. Mm-hmm. Now, it works by by interfering with the virus's replication, uh, this prevents it from multiplying, keeping virus levels low in the body and therefore reducing the severity of disease. Basically, it's blocking its power to re- uh, replicate. The pill is also pending review at regulators in the US, the EU and elsewhere as well, and mm. possibly Korea. Who knows? All right. On to our third keyword of the day. Coal power phase out. So more than 40 countries at COP26 have agreed to phase out coal-fired power. Uh, but there are major coal producers who haven't signed on to the agreement. And they are the biggest, well, greenhouse gas emissions emitting countries. They are indeed. And yeah. uh, the exact reasons as to why they didn't join are, right. are yet to be revealed. There's a lot of conspiracies and speculation as to why, but I won't go into that. Because in that's not today. really helpful to no. the discussion, is it? Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of theories, but uh, that's mm. not what is important now. What is important is the agreement, and there are major coal-using uh, countries that include Poland, Vietnam, and Chile. They're mm. among those to make the uh, commitment. They have also agreed to uh, phase out coal power in the 2030s for major economies and the 2040s for poorer nations. But some of the world's biggest coal-dependent uh, countries, as you said, the US, China, India, uh, did not sign up. Uh, dozens of organizations, meanwhile, did sign up, actually, to the pledge. Mm-hmm. Several major banks agreeing to stop financing the coal industry as mm-hmm. well, so cutting off the money uh, lines. Mm-hmm. Separately, more than 20 countries, now this time it did include the US, they agreed to end public financing of international fossil fuel projects beginning next year. Uh, Many campaigners welcomed the suite of announcements on coal, but critics are sceptical of these flurry of announcements. None of these commitments are binding. Mm. Uh, There is no way to enforce countries to cut coal and no way to police uh, this uh, kind of um, initiative. Right, right. Uh, And how many of the plans to stop using coal in developing countries will need financial support from uh, the developed world? That's another question that's being raised. Right. So there are questions over whether the rich countries can pay others to do what they are struggling to do at home. All right. So Mm. I came across the uh, next month's Economist cover and it said in light of COP26 in big, bold letters, cop out. (laughs) And and you understand the humor behind it. But for all of its flaws, such global gatherings remains the only set of forum to force change. So unfortunately, it will be this format. But I can understand the scrutiny. Yeah, I mean, there's there's bound to be some criticism to these policies and the pledges and agreements that they make and MOUs or whatnot and deals. But um, Mm. yeah. Yeah, they are very, 
extravagant and a very um, some might say superficial, but and the vague fact, and vague. But the fact that they're there in the first place is meaningful as well. So there mm. is some solace to be taken from that. All right. Yeah. Now that we've given you all of the perspectives, <laughs> you make your decision on how yeah. you feel about it. On to our fourth keyword of the day. Nuclear phase-out confusion. So there has been some confusion surrounding President Moon Jae-in's push to phase out nuclear power. His meeting with Visegrad leaders in Hungary seems to be uh, contradicting that exact plan. Mm. So tell us more. Yeah, President Moon Jae-in agreed to help Hungary and Poland uh, with nuclear power ambitions, despite his own phasing out nuclear power at mm. home. Uh, this came through agreement signed on a visit to Hungary on Wednesday uh, with a meeting with these Visegrad leaders, which include uh, middle European countries, basically. Mm. Um, Hungarian President um, uh, Janos Ada told reporters after a summit with Moon that it is the shared intention of the two countries that carbon neutrality cannot be achieved without nuclear energy. Now, Moon did not actually comment on the topic during his address to the press, uh, after, uh, other than saying that he looks forward to working with Hungary on what he called digital transformation and green transformation. Mm. So he kind of steered away from the topic. Uh, responding to the confusion, though, the presidential office later said that there has been no change to the government's nuclear phase-out policy. Mm. Uh, and a Changwada official said the nuclear phase-out policy is to reduce the share of nuclear power over the very long term until 2080 and instead <sighs> raise the share of new renewable energy and hydrogen energy uh, in order to achieve carbon neutrality. All right, we'll leave it there for now and on to our fifth keyword of the day. Committed to sanctions. The U.S. is taking a slightly more hardline stance against North Korea, however, saying it's committed to implementing international sanctions. So can you mm. run us through what was said? Yeah, not slightly more hardline, but not mm. as uh, hardline as maybe um, some of the comments uh, in the previous administration had said. <laughs> uh, but the State Department spokesperson, Ned Price, uh, he also, as well as saying that the U.S. will implement sanctions, he also urged other U.N. members to do the same to prevent North Korea from further advancing its weapons program, namely nuclear and ballistic missiles. Now, the remarks came after a report, actually, that said China and Russia have circulated a draft resolution to UN Security Council members to lift a host of sanctions against the North. Mm. Um, Price declined to comment directly on what he called internal workings of the UNSC. Uh, He only reiterated US commitment to working with North Korea through diplomacy. He also called on Pyongyang to refrain from provocations probably uh, alluding Mm. to the the recent missile tests, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and to engage in discussions. And he reiterated that Washington has no hostile intent towards Pyongyang. That's Mm. kind of the main issue that Pyongyang has been taking with the U.S. That the U.S. is hostile towards North Korea. Right. The comments Mm. coming from both sides is the same uh, every time that these announcements come. The rhetoric seems to be very similar. All right, on to our last keyword of the day. Samsung market share. Samsung is gaining ground in the smartphone shipment market despite difficulties with supplies of some key materials like semiconductors. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's the latest? <laughs> yeah, you think semiconductors are quite important for a smartphone, <laughs> but it seems to be uh, picking up and uh, the company or uh, these major smartphone yeah. manufacturers aren't doing too badly for the third quarter anyway. Uh, the US market is because it's, uh, it's showing signs of recovery, so that's ma- partly the reason why. Mm. Uh, in the third quarter, the US smartphone market grew 1% year on year and 9% quarter and quarter. This allowed many phone makers, including Samsung, to secure enough support Apply to boost shipments. Mm. Now, according to CounterPoint research, Apple and Samsung continue to lead in Q3, accounting for 77% of total shipments, so mm. very uh, dominant. Mm. Both saw strong year on year growth at 9% and 18%, respectively. So Samsung had actually the biggest jump. Mm. Uh, Apple, still at the top, has the most market share with 43%. Samsung has 35 mm. uh, Samsung has narrow, uh, managed to narrow that gap to a 7 percentage point uh, difference with Apple. Last year it was nine, so it they are. It seems that we can accredit the foldable phones a little bit. Yeah, they're quite uh, uh, popular. Uh, yeah, the increased share uh, is due to mostly these two new fold- foldable phones, mm. uh, as well as bringing its most affordable 5G smartphone, namely the Galaxy A32 mm. 5G, to the American market as well mm. to compete with the kind of the lower budget uh, phone manufacturers. All right, thank you so much for a week's worth of coverage, Adam. Do have yourself a safe weekend. You too. It's gonna be cold next week i know so be sure to enjoy last of autumn thank you (laughs) (laughs) see you next week see you next week 
If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.